as most of the speakers, um, if not all, not all, I think, but most, I will talk about my research here, which is on the moons of, of the largest planets in our solar system. But uh, um, in preparation for this like uh, presentation marathon, we were told we can basically speak about whatever we want. Um, so I will also, um, not extremely exciting, but a little bit speak about my um, journey from being a graduate student in Cologne um, to now standing here at KTH and representing my, my research, which also has a little bit to do um, with this guy here, which we have just uh, learned a lot about, Hannes Alvén. Um, so I kind of mix it all together um, and uh, with the focus, of course, on, on research and the Jupiter moons. So um, during my PhD in Cologne, um, these four moons were already, or uh, actually mostly two of them, um, the main topic of my studies. And uh, in this family picture, you see the, the large planet here to the right. So Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. Uh, and it's way larger than Earth. It's 10 times larger. You would even fit Earth into this uh, great red spot here easily. Um, and all these uh, four moons um, are just four of them. And Jupiter has 67 moons in total. Um, but only these four have, uh, are of considerable size and have radii larger than a thousand kilometers. And, and are, all of them are very interesting um, and actually very different from one to each other. So we can start with Io, the, the closest one, which is the volcanically most active body in our solar system. And then moving out uh, is next is Europa and then Ganymede and Callisto, which are all ice moons, which means they're all um, completely covered in ice. Um, and at least Europa and Ganymede also harbor um, a layer of liquid water inside under the ice. So uh, um, very interesting um, already seeing the moons like this. But in my research, um, I look at auroral emission. So I look at the northern lights of these moons, which are excited just in the same way as northern lights are excited at Earth by charged particles that collide with the neutrals in the atmospheres. Um, and then photons are emitted which we observe, and in this case, uh, we observe it mostly um, at UV light, at ultraviolet light, and mostly with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, so far. So if you look at these four moons in UV light, uh, they look very different. So what we see is not any more light reflected from the surface, um, but you only see the emissions from the atmosphere. And the reason is you don't see um, the actual moon in a way anymore, uh, you don't see it anymore, is that first the reflectivity for UV light is really low and then the solar flux at UV uh, wavelength is also low. So um, that makes it so good to, to see the emissions from the, the relatively faint emissions from the atmospheres from these moons. And uh, just like the moons, the morphology and the emission pattern of the auroral emissions are very different between them. And we can start with Europa here. We don't really know what's going on. It's um, basically emissions all over the place. It's very patchy. It's moving from the North Pole to the South Pole and back. Um, and it's still mostly not understood what's going on here. Then going to Io, um, you see the brightest emissions are somewhere near the equator. And most images are, um, the morphology is dominated by two spots uh, near the equator, just like seen here. And Ganymede then, is kind of similar to like polar lights as we know them. Um, it's like assembled along um, ovals or circles, one around the northern hemisphere, one around the southern hemisphere. And that's because uh, this moon is the only moon that has its own magnetic field, at least that we know of. So the magnetic field of the moon can shield uh, the charged particles in some regions and accelerate the charged particles to create the emissions in other regions. Um, Callisto, actually, uh, we cannot really map emissions from Callisto because they are too faint. So all we see here is, is noise, actually. Uh, emissions have been detected, but only a faint signal, so you cannot kind of make an image. Um, so that was the work I'm, I've been doing um, in Cologne. And when finishing my, my PhD in 2012, I was looking for a place to continue working on this. Um, and then got in contact um, with the Southwest Research Institute in Texas. So they build instruments, they build UV cameras for spacecraft um, that are actually at the moment at Jupiter and will fly to the moons particularly of Jupiter. And through that contact, um, rather than moving north from Cologne, um, I moved all the way across the ocean 
to San Antonio, um, the often forgotten seventh biggest city of the U.S. And uh, because it's southern Texas, um, it's been rather warm. And um, coming from like I don't know, mid Europe, moderate climate, um, I was pretty overwhelmed by like um, climate where we have eight months of 35 degrees Celsius and more in the afternoon every day again. It's not really that dry in San Antonio, which is rather green. Um, but when you go like to West Texas, you can also see these really dry areas. And then you go on the road trip, you look on your digital map on your phone, and you see like, oh, there's a lake. That's a good place for a lunch break. And then you drive to the lake, and it turns out there's no lake anymore. Um, it's just uh, your digital map with still things forever, for whatever reason, that is a lake. Uh, so yeah, you encounter this instead. Um, so being in the heat, um, and often rather dry heat. Um, I was working with a cold moon, with Europa, um, the, the icy moon and the maybe most interesting moon because we basically know that under this um, ice surface there is a global huge uh, ocean of liquid water and the amount of water in that ocean might be even two to three times more than the entire water that we have on Earth here. So it's, it's a huge amount of water. Um, we just we have never seen it. We have detected indirectly because it's it's under the the ice. And uh, so, what did we do with our um, images from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Aurora missions? So we looked at one image that shows emissions at hydrogen from the hydrogen atom, and then we looked at another image um, from oxygen. And the detection of these like bright few bright pixels here was already surprising because you do not expect um, strong emissions from hydrogen at Europa. And then the coincident, like little emission surplus in these same pixels here um, kind of told us about the, the origin of these emissions at hydrogen. So the relative and absolute brightness of these two few pixels here um, kind of could only be explained by the existence of, of active outgassing of, of water vapor, of H2O. So um, what we see here uh, is basically this. Um, clearly, and uh, I mean it was a big discovery. It was in the news everywhere. People get excited just because I mean Europa is this moon with a giant ocean, and it's the, one of the most promising candidates for for life in our solar system. And basically, the existence of such outgassing locations would allow us um, to get to, to or would give us access to the ocean um, below the ice surface. There are still debates about the their existence and their occurrence. Um, there has been some confirmation uh, with a different technique, but it's, it's not settled yet, I would say. Um, so having discovered these, these water geysers on an icy moon, I sometimes uh, rather wished I had discovered a water geyser in Texas uh, and was wishing for, for more water. And uh, so through the research on the auroral emissions at the moons, uh, I was also in contact with the researchers that work on, on Earth Aurora um, at KTH here. And uh, so instead of uh, um, finding water in Texas, I found my way to water, uh, applied for a position here, got the funding and moved to, to Sweden where definitely there's, there's more water um, than in most places in Texas. I don't want to be... Uh, to root here, so it was already nice coming here the first time after a long summer on a plane, seeing all the the trees and lakes, and I still I still really enjoy it. Research-wise, uh, I turned my attention to another moon, which is more dry. So this is Io, the neighbor moon of Europa, the what I said, what I call it, volcanically most active body in our solar system, and it's really amazing that you kind of all the features you see on the surface. Um, are more or less volcanoes, are volcanic outflows, um, hot pits, uh, yeah, uh, lava um, flows, and it builds its structures, the whole surface, and when you want to compare um, a number, an impressive number, you can take the, the average heat flow at the surface, so how much heat is transported by the volcanic activity from the interior to the surface, and that's about 20 times higher uh, than at Earth. So this is really um, a, a very volcanically active body. Uh, if you want to do the, the temperature comparison, it's, it's not that uh, compelling because we're far away from the sun. Um, standing somewhere 
not on a in a like a lava pit somewhere on the surface it's still one minus uh, minus 100 degrees celsius so I, I couldn't say it's hot but anyway it's volcanically hot and uh, sometimes up to a thousand uh, celsius when you're standing in a in a lava lake um, so what did we do with our aurora images uh, if you recall in the beginning i showed the image of the aurora of io it was dominated by two bright spots and uh, what we did then is we said okay let's take the aurora to look inside the moon and for io it was proposed that it possesses an a layer of of liquid magma so just like the the water ocean inside europa that there's a magma ocean inside io and uh, because liquid magma has a relatively high electric conductivity um, currents can flow in this liquid magma and the blue lines here show the magnetic field of Jupiter that's constantly changing at the moon um, changing orientation from this to this in the other picture here and when you have a changing magnetic field and an electrically conductive medium you generate currents in the in the medium so in the magma ocean and these currents generate a secondary magnetic field and uh, because there's a minus in the uh, in Faraday's law of induction I'm finally getting to some physics here. Uh, the secondary magnetic fields are directed uh, in the opposite way to the primary fields. So what happens is then that basically this, the time variability of this uh, primary field, which goes back and forth, is cancelled out if you have a magma ocean um, inside the moon. And because the auroral emissions are kind of at the places where the magnetic field line touches the body, and if you cancel out uh, the variation, as you can see here with the straight line, they wouldn't move at all. But if you have the strong variation, they move up and down. So we observed in a time series over a longer time, um, how are these equatorial bright spots changing? And these are just the extremes, but you can already see, I mean, in, in terms of expected variability, this is a strong oscillation. So they go from from this to this and uh, constantly back and the amplitude of the oscillation is pretty much what you predict from the, the amplitude of the changing magnetic field. Um, so, in result was that looking at these images we could say is there a magma ocean inside Io? Probably not, but since we're contradicting a previous study it's also still uh, an open topic and uh, further studies are needed to finally find out Magma ocean or not, water geysers or not, um, well, time will tell. Um, okay, I promised there's some connection of my research to, to Hannes Alvén in the beginning, and there actually is an, an important uh, proof for the existence of these mag uh, magnetohydrodynamic waves he predicted and he kind of discovered in a way in the Jupiter system. So looking again at the whole system, this is the planet in the middle, um, with the strong magnetic field shown here by the blue lines and then you have the um, the moons in, in, in their orbits around the planet and the purple like uh, connection connecting lines here from the moons to the planets they show um, in a way the the Alvin waves traveling along the magnetic field lines you have an interaction at the moon because the magnetic field is moving relative to the moon so it's perturbed and these perturbations in form of uh, standing Alvin waves travel all the way um, down to the planet to the North Pole um, and the South Pole of the planet and what we see there when we look at the aurora of the planet we see discrete spots that follow the orbit um, orbits of the moons around the planet so you can see that these uh, the outstanding in particular the outstanding property of these waves to travel very long distances um, without any loss um, is very nicely illustrated um, by the existence of these distinctive spots on Jupiter's uh, aurora on Jupiter's North Pole um, created basically by the moons and uh, this was one of the first proofs for the existence of um, of the magnetohydrodynamic waves predicted by Hannes Alvin and uh, so that's kind of uh, the closure for me and I'm very happy to uh, to be here in the land of lots of water and Hannes Alvin uh, and thank you for your attention <laughs>